charge and the atom. In this video, we're going to learn a little background about the atom. We're going to uh, learn where charge comes from, and we're going to see uh, uh, what the what forces are created by those charges, and they're pretty big forces. So uh, remember to pause the video when you see the pause video indicator and do a great job taking notes. Discovering the atom. Democritus, way back in 400 BC, theorized that everything was made up of atoms. Wow, he was right all the way back then. John Dalton in 1802 proposed that atoms of different types interact to make up all material things. J.J. Thompson, with his cathode ray tube, discovered the electron and the fact that atoms are actually made up of other parts. Ernest Rutherford, in 1911, uh, found with his gold leaf experiment that atoms have a nucleus where most of their mass is located. Niel Bohr theorized that the model of an atom with a positive nucleus and with electrons orbiting around that nucleus. Ernest Rutherford, in 1917 to 1920 discovered the proton and James Chadwick discovered the neutron. It's quite amazing that uh, just uh, in less than a hundred years how much we have developed technology based on the uh, this theory of the atom in such a short period of time. This is great history to record craziness of the atom. Protons and neutrons are made up of even smaller particles called quarks. Electrons don't really orbit, but they have certain areas where they're more likely to be buzzing around. This is quantum theory. And atoms are almost pure empty space. If you could squeeze all of the space out from between all of the protons, electrons, and neutrons that make you up, you would be invisible. And yet that invisible speck would weigh the same amount as you do now. Crazy stuff. This is Cambridge University in England, where Ernest Rutherford, Niels Bohr, and other famous physicists did scientific research. Imagine a single atom the size of this courtyard. If we think of that being the size of an atom, then the size of the nucleus would only be one millimeter in diameter. That's a bit smaller than this little grain of sand that I've got in my hand here. In other words, what it means is atoms are essentially empty space. Now, how can we reconcile that with the fact that matter is matter and my hands don't go through one another? Well, that's crazy because if it's mostly empty space, they should pass right through one another. But what we understand now is in fact, the reason my hands don't go through one another is that while the space is empty, what it's filled with is really electric fields. When the electrons come within a very small distance of each other, they begin to repel each other, and that's why things appear to be solid when they are actually not. Now, you may think that I'm sitting on this chair, but actually that's not true. I'm actually hovering over this chair, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters over this chair, because of the electrons of my body are repelling the electrons of this chair. Let's check out a rough model of the atom. By a rough model, I mean that it, it's really not what an atom would be like. This nucleus would be so, so tiny and so, so far away from these uh, electrons here that are uh, orbiting, if you will. And these, these electrons wouldn't be in a nice, clear, uh, clean orbit. There would, there would be different probabilities of where they would be buzzing around uh, this nucleus. But it's a model that can help us understand a little bit about the atom uh, visually um, as we talk about the charge uh, of certain particles here. So electrons, first of all, are these little particles that uh, buzz around and orbit the nucleus and they are negatively charged. They have um, an equal amount of charge but uh, the opposite in polarity we say to protons which are positively charged. And the protons are in the nucleus of the atom here um, along with these other particles called neutrons. Now the particles here are called neutrons because they are neutral. They do not have electrical charge. So this would be a great illustration uh, of uh, this uh, helium atom and uh, also if you could take note of these three things here. 
Here are some examples of atoms. This is the hydrogen atom with one proton and one electron. Hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons. This is helium that we just saw a second ago. Helium has two of each particle, uh, two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. A proton has the same amount of charge as the electron. It's the same magnitude of charge, this quantity of charge here. But it is 2,000 times more massive. So protons are 2,000 times more massive than electrons. And yet they have the same electrical charge. Every atom uh, has the same uh, number of electrons and protons, unless it is an ion, what we call an ion, where we strip electrons away from the atom. But as we're going to see, nature is very balanced electrically. So pretty much every um, atom has the same number of electrons as protons. And uh, as the atoms get bigger and bigger in size, they need more and more neutrons. And we'll see uh, why that's true in just a little bit. And finally, what makes an atom different from other atoms is the number of protons. If an atom only has one proton, it is a hydrogen atom. Helium is helium because it has two protons. And one more atom to look at, especially because it's so important to electricity that we're going to be talking about soon, is copper. Uh, copper has 29 protons and 29 electrons and needs 35 neutrons to hold the nucleus together with the strong force. So we'll talk about the strong force in a minute here, but we notice that it needs more neutrons than it has protons. And notice also that it has one electron hanging way out here, way away from the nucleus, and it's by itself in this outermost valence is what it's called. And that's really what makes copper a very good conductor, is this is not going to be held, this electron is not held very tightly uh, to, the, to this nucleus because it's so far away. And uh, we're going to see that the electrical force uh, will allow it to be stripped away easily. So uh, that's copper. So, two questions should really kind of come to mind at this point. Why don't electrons get attracted to the protons in the nucleus? Well, in other words, why don't they collapse in? And that's where Bohr said it was maybe like the, uh, being in orbits like the moon around the Earth, and it was uh, their, maybe their inertia that kept them around, but we find out later it's really because of quantum uh, physics and the, and the wave nature, if you will, of electrons. And uh, based on quantum theory here, which, whoa, can get kind of complex mathematically, uh, we, uh, we don't delve into uh, the particulars of it. We just know that it's impossible for electrons to get that close to the nucleus because of what we call their wavelength. And this is a wave function in quantum physics. And the other question, why don't the protons push away from each other if they are like charges? Why are they, why are they sticking around together in the nucleus, hanging out together, uh, especially copper with 29 protons, if they are like charged and they want to repel? Well, they actually are pushing away from each other electrically. So they're electrically trying to get away from each other. But the strong force within the nucleus uh, is created by the interaction between protons and neutrons, which is, a, uh, which is a stronger force, and that's why it's called the strong force, than the electrical force. See, these uh, uh, protons and neutrons are juggling back and forth photons, and they can't, uh, they can't stop juggling these pro uh, uh, photons back and forth. Uh, and uh, it's that force that's created by juggling those photons back and forth that holds them together, kind of like glue. So if you have lots and lots and lots of protons, you need even more glue from the, if you will, from the, nu from the neutrons in order to hold those protons in the nucleus against their electrical will. Charge in the Coulomb. Charles Coulomb. Uh, 
protons and electrons are tiny, 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 uh, and their charges are tiny as well. However, there are lots of protons and lots of electrons in matter. So charge is given the symbol Q and is measured in Coulomb C, named after Charles Coulomb. The ampere uh, measure of current was used before electrons and protons were discovered. The uh, Coulomb was defined as 6.28 times 10 to the 18th charges because that's how many charges flow by in one second when the current is one ampere, which is a standard unit of current long discovered before we discovered the atom and that charges were so so small so q is equal to one coulomb if q is equal to one coulomb then the charge is whoa lots and lots and lots of charges combined what's crazy is this is about how many charges flow through a uh, light bulb in about one and a half to two seconds Electric force, Coulomb's law. Charles Coulomb discovered the, rela the relationship between the amount of charge and the force they build up, and this is known as Coulomb's law. It looks an awful lot like gravity, if you remember the uh, force of gravity, and it's the same inverse square law is what it's called. So the force between two charged objects, this one and this one, is equal and opposite. In this particular case, obviously these charges are of different sign, positive and negative, because these force vector arrows are showing attraction, they're coming toward each other, and R is the distance between them. So the closer they get, uh, the smaller R is here, and the force gets bigger and bigger rapidly, because this goes as a square. And then the bigger the charge between them, the much more force there is. Again, this is uh, the fundamental law that holds everything in our universe together, along with gravity and the strong force and the weak force. But this one is probably responsible for the most phenomena that we uh, perceive in our world. Very powerful stuff. The electric force is huge. Now, granted, particles are super tiny, so any couple of particles won't give very much of a force, but there are so many particles that make up the matter that we're used to in our world. The electric force is very, very strong compared to gravity. If you and another person were half a meter apart, which is normal standing distance if you're having a conversation, and had only 1% more electrons, 1%, only 1% more electrons than protons on your bodies, then the force between the two of you would be greater than the weight of the Earth. Doesn't seem like it would be possible, but that's how strong the electric force really is. Matter is almost perfectly electrically balanced. Because the electrical force is so, so strong, uh, electricity will balance itself out rather uh, abruptly sometimes. That's why lightning is so powerful and persistent. It's crazy that on average lightning strikes somewhere on Earth about every four seconds to keep the charge balanced after the rubbing of the air molecules builds up that charge. Check out this video with uh, lightning here coming up, satellite imagery of our Earth. And uh, first thing is look at how thin the Earth's atmosphere is here. But next, you're going to see the lightning strikes coming up here. And, and uh, it's crazy right in this cloud right here how the lightning just zapping, zapping, zapping all over the place as, this, uh, as the Earth goes by here. How many lightning storms there are at any given moment. And Scratch's parting thought. And I agree 100% Scratch. And I'm excited to see all the stuff we can learn about the forces uh, between those protons and electrons. And good luck as you charge and strive for continuous improvement.